So, if you're on YouTube and you like cats, then presumably you probably know who the helpful Vancouver vet is, Dr. Yuri Burstein. And today, we're having a discussion about a paper that came out last year about cats being psychopaths. Uh, big clue, our conclusion is that no, they're not. Uh, but today, we really get into the nitty-gritty of cat behavior and personalities, how humans have a tendency to project themselves onto their wards, and some of the differences you might get between feral cats and non-feral cats, just in terms of their demeanor and just how they act and, and what you can expect from them. Um, yeah, so if you want to head straight to the interview, uh, go to this time here. Uh, but I just really need to plug a local cat charity that's uh, very dear to me because that's where we're fostering that little one from and her little sister's down there. And, uh, and that's also where we got th our three cats from. And they're really struggling at the moment for money and donations, mainly because of the pandemic and the cost of living crisis that we have at the moment. And they had a big influx of feral cats over the winter that they're still struggling with now. Um, they're way beyond capacity. And literally, as even a single quid would really help them go a long way. So uh, the link is in the description below to the Concert Cat Charity in the northeast of England. And uh, yeah, go and check them out. They're wonderful people, uh, very hardworking. And... They just do so much for cats uh, in the local area. So anyway, on with the show. Sit back and enjoy. Yeah, one of the things I was thinking then is like, because obviously as a vet, you're coming into this with a a really detailed understanding of cats. But yeah. then, you know, maybe in human psychology might not be, I don't know. So do, you, is there, do you know much about psychopathy or what's your impression of it? Well, uh, I, I personally don't know much about say, psychopathy beyond uh, what mm. one learns from pop, you know, pop yeah. culture websites. And uh, yeah, I have a, a pop psychology understanding of psychopathy. Mm. Uh, but what I do have an understanding of is that the, for the very first thing you learn in any animal behavior or animal welfare course in university is to not anthropomorphize your subjects. Mm. And of course, anthropomorphization means uh, apply human I guess, is to ignore the fact that animals are different from humans, to apply human motivations and human psychology to animals. Yes. And it, it's, it's absolutely the, the, the first key mistake people make in trying to understand animals. And it's the yeah. one you're warned about in any kind, of, any kind of formal course in animal behavior or training or, or um, welfare is to not anthropomorphize your subjects, yeah. which doesn't mean that, I mean, there's a huge amount of commonality between animals and humans. Mm. Um, I think animals are, are personalities in their own right, but they're not human personality. Their worldview is completely different. Their okay. brain structure is completely different. Their evolutionary niche is completely different. So it's just, mm -hmm. it, I feel like that appreciation is really central to any, any kind of rational attempt to understand animals, and it's completely missing from this paper. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Out the window, I'm <laughs> Yeah, that's that's certainly what I found was that because um, I understand what they were trying to do, where previous research has only looked at positive behaviors and they wanted to bring in the negative behaviors and claiming that the positive behaviors are anthropomorphizing. But then I felt like the negative behaviors were similarly anthropomorphizing because, like mm -hmm. you're saying, like it, the motivation is the key because I kind of one of the things I often think about is how cats play and hunt. And I. I kind of think that the reason why cats enjoy hunting is because they're quite lazy in some ways and the species would die out if it wasn't <laughs> a fun activity to do, do you know? Um, yeah, so yeah, like their motivation isn't evil, like the, it's not malevolence, you know, it's, it's a completely different thing. Yeah, well, I mean, this is a species that are obligate carnivores. They literally yeah. cannot live on a diet that doesn't come from, from, from meat. Like they yeah. have to have meat in their diet. And mm. meat comes from things you kill. You yeah. Know, unless you're a scavenger, of course. But they're not a scavenger. We know that no. they, they don't scavenge in nature. They, they mm. like fresh kills. Yeah. Um, so the only way a cat can live is to kill things. Yeah. Um, and, and so, of course, I, I'm sure they take joy in it. Because uh, mm. exactly like you said, it's, it's absolutely central to their existence. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think that, well, when you think about how... I find cats are a paradox in a way that where they're both prey animals and almost apex predators, depending on their context. 
And yeah. you, you've got to have a big motivation to want to leave your hole where you're warm and safe and snuggled and then to go out and risk death and danger <laughs> and, to, and to survive and eat. You know, there's got to be a big motivation there. And I think that it's just a theory that I have anyway, that that's why cats enjoy it so much. And like, it's not torture because, you know. Well, even, even saying that the cats enjoy hunting is, a, is, is again, we're falling into the anthropomorphization. Yeah. Um, we we can't really say a cat, if a cat's enjoying something or not. Mm. What we can say is that it actively pursues like a hunting behavior and yeah. engages in it uh, as much as it can. Or so we, mm. I guess, enjoy is that we can certainly imagine that it's joyful to them. We can hope that <laughs> they enjoy it. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, especially like there's that perception that cats are cruel because they toy mm. with their prey or because they. Or like the you know, humans have this perception that cats really like torment their prey, right? Yeah. Because um, we always have this image of a cat like batting a mouse around or throwing a toy up <laughs> in the air. Um, mm. But there's actually there's a really interesting behavioral study that was to describe uh, uh, cat. They describe explain this phenomenon, and uh, they looked specifically at I think it was in Mexico City, but I could be wrong about that. About feral cats who hunted rats. And of course, a rat, you know, it can be like one and a half, one kilo, one point two kilo. They're actually quite a large animal compared to like maybe a three yeah. to five kilogram cat. So they're actually hunting, and they and rats can bite very hard. They're very sharp mm. teeth. They carry infections, so a bite from a rat carries very high biologic cost because if you get bitten by a rat, yeah. you get an abscess that could kill you easily. Yeah. Um. So they're very dangerous prey, but they're also a high value prey because they're large. Yeah. Um, and so they looked at this idea of cats hunting these big prey items and they found that there was a lot of this kind of torture behavior where they would bat them around they would chase them around they wouldn't go for the kill they wouldn't try to kill these things fast they would, mm. what, what a what a, a human looking at it would say well why are you toying with this if you're going to kill it just kill it right yeah but in reality what they were doing was they're actually uh trying to tire out and disorient the rat because it reduces the likelihood of receiving a bite because oh, the way cats kill things is by biting their neck and dislocating their cervical vertebrae. So mm. they have to go in there and bite them in the back of the neck and get their tooth between the vertebrae, pop them open, and then it's instant death. But of course, uh, that you know, the neck is very close to the bitey end of a rat. <laughs> yeah. And if you try to bite a, a big, angry, strong rat on the neck, sometimes they're going to bite you on the face. And that's yeah. a very bad thing to happen to you if you're a cat. Yeah. So all of this like wicked, evil, naughty hunting behavior you're observing is actually you have to tire out your prey. You have to disorient them by batting at them with paws. That's why they give mm. it the paw, right? Yeah. It, and they do that, the boxing thing. and That's right. Yeah. yeah. Because it's to <laughs> disorient the prey. So the venom they do go in for that um, that kill that, yeah. that would happens quickly and with minimal risk to the cat. Mm. So it is like one shot, one kill, but they have to line it up correctly, basically. It's interesting. Yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm just thinking about all the wider implications of that research. That's so interesting. Um, yeah, because what one of the things that they referenced about psychopathic behavior in the paper was about uh, in primates, um, some primates cannibalize their young. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but they use quite emotive language when they were describing it in the paper. Um, and it kind of, built this imagery of like this feral tribe of chimpanzees just ripping apart their young and devouring them and yeah it's some kind of feast or something it was a bit disturbing but um <laughs> but it's like the, the chimpanzees could have so many reasons for doing that and like it's not necessarily psychopathic behavior because i think this is the crux of it is is that application of trying to take a, a human um a human set of I guess, personality traits and ascribing them to these animals that don't have the same level of complexity that we do. And we don't know what their emotional and motivational experiences are in their minds. And a lot of this is on the, it's, it's on a report of how we feel when we observe the cats. It doesn't tell us anything about them, just like the chimpanzees. It, just knowing that they cannibalize their young doesn't mean they're cannibals by trade, you know. Yeah, I mean that's, that's, that's a, I think that's a really good point that it, that it's easy to reference how we feel when we observe an animal rather than an imprint and sort of use that to interpret animal's behavior rather than looking at objectively from the animal's point of view. And 
I can see how with primates it'd be very tempting because they do resemble us so much, but they're not us. They're they're yeah. how many tens of millions of years divergent from us, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that, that's a really just fascinating point, though. Uh, we do project, like humans project, right? Is, isn't that what yeah. we do? Uh, this is yeah. going outside of my scope of expertise, but... Um, <laughs> well, no, it, uh, we definitely do. Um, a lot of our stuff, I mean, um, Freud spoke about this a lot. You know, we, I mean, Freud, very controversial figure, but he identified a lot of the links in human psychology. He might have over-sexualized them, but, you know, he identified the links. Um, and yeah, a lot of what we do is about projecting ourselves and our image onto onto the people around us. It's, it's very interesting how we do it, but yeah, we do it with cats as well. So I imagine that something like this study is quite uh, controversial within, I guess, the vet community. Um, yeah, I mean, do, do you ever see any actual impact when you're speaking to your patient, uh, the your clients, or? I mean, I, I'll, I'll say that. Within the vet community, it gets laughed off very quickly. Okay. Uh, with, I, I would say in the larger community of people, of cat owners, I don't think, I think people who share their life with a cat mm. uh, either would disregard such a finding or find it endearing. Because let's face it, there's millions of memes on the internet yeah. uh, that are focused about what jerks cats are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, like, yeah. You know, I think... You know, they're little trash goblins who just mm. sneak into our life and make just to make it more miserable. And I think there's <laughs> yeah. a masochistic streak to cat owners who really yeah. enjoy having a little, yeah. a little, a little jerk in the house who just knock things off your desk and yeah. look you in the eye as they do it. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I, I don't think it's really of an impact on people who share life with cats. I mean, if I have to express a concern, it might be to uh, perhaps families who have never had a cat before and are thinking, of, you know, the kids are growing up and maybe we should get a kitten who might read this and think <laughs> once about it, which would be a very unfortunate because it's a real misrepresentation of cats. I mean, not to say that cats aren't complete jerks. Yeah. But, but they're not psychopaths. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they have the capacity for it, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, because one of the things that they, when they were talking about um, psych psychopathy, um, I noticed the researcher, when um, she was talking on Twitter to somebody, trying to say that, like, we're not calling cats psychopaths. We're saying that they show traits of that mimic psychopathy. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I think, you know, it does come back to that, um, the translation of that human behavior again, okay. saying that it's, yeah. Well, I would ask you, what are those traits that they identified that mimic psychopathy? Let's break it down. Like, yeah. what are they seeing cats in this paper that mimics human psychopathy? Yeah, boldness, meanness, and disinhibition. Yeah. Well, let's break it down because when I read the paper, I um, I took real like, exception to the to these to, to yeah. the, their, uh, attributing of these characteristics to cat behavior. So, yeah. um, if you have the paper open with you, mm -hmm. why don't we just actually look at those three traits and and let's describe. Let, can you, if you have it in front of you, could you read out the, the the behavior that they observed that they would then for each of those traits, and then let's break it down. So they say that um, boldness is a behavioral expression of a low innate fear quotient related to psychopathy. So um, if you're bold, um, you're going to be a bit more outgoing and you're not going to have this innate fear of things around you. You're just going to go out and experience the world. Um, it's a good description of a cat, because as you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, cats are middle of the food chain predators. So cats yeah. who don't have fear of the world around them. Uh, they, <laughs> Darwin has a lot of things to say about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what did they observe to, to ascribe boldness to these cats? Well, um, they didn't actually observe anything themselves. Um, when they sent in the questionnaire to people, they sent in a short definition of each trait of the boldness, meanness, and disinhibition. Yeah. And um, they basically gave a definition of those and asked the participants to say, has your cat ever done something like this? Give us a behavior that would fulfill this criteria we've given you. Mm -hmm. um, so they ended up with a bunch of um, uh, sort of like themes based yeah, I'm on that. I'm trying to find the actual question because I think when I looked at the actual paper on, they actually had the questions, at least in the abstract. Yeah. Yeah, they've they've got um, a list of how participants responded. Um, right. So it, you know they might say my cat demands attention, so they'll tap people with his his or her paw to play. 
or my cat walks on and sits on items I'm trying to use. Uh, right. They misbehave if not shown attention, all that sort of thing. And then that's how they responded. So it's like, oh, you know, if your cat was bold, tell us how they were bold. <laughs> right. It was very basic what they asked the um, what they asked of the participants. Yeah, because I think a lot of those are interpretations of boldness are actually mm. very uh, wrong. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for example, like like a cat approaching a human uh, who's a part of its family member to greet them would not necessarily be has not to do with boldness, right? It, it, has, yeah. it just has to do with maybe social bonding. Um, it's 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 not really a measure of the cat's. Of, I guess, to my understanding, is bold. What's the definition of boldness in the human uh, context? It's it's basically bravery, right? Yeah, that's what I've always thought. Like you just is that a more technical term? Right. Risk taking would that be a more technical term? Yeah, because of the low level of innate fear. Um, yeah. But the thing is. It, I might even say that innate fear, I would have thought, is about more natural things, like um, aversion to spiders or rats or that sort of thing. That's that's how I would have seen an innate fear. So, but they're ascribing, I mean, for example, they've got a fearlessness category. Um, so it's like my cat explores dangerous places. Uh, right. Gardens of rival cats are very high places, or my cat explores new places. So they'd say that... Cats that explore like that have a low level of fear. Right. Yeah. And I think that might actually be so. I know that in a veterinary context, exploring behavior in cats is associated with boldness um, okay. or at least not being stressed out. And it's actually, it's actually relaxing rather than and low level of stress rather than low level of fear. Because mm. um, again, fear is a projected human emotion. We can say a mm. cat is tense because we, it's afraid, but that's an interpretation. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's certainly uh, an exploratory behavior is relaxing to cats. Mm. Um, I mean, conversely, yeah, that's an interesting, um, interesting interpretation. I'm trying to think. There's a couple. What did they actually ask these people? I wish we actually had the questionnaire. The yeah, I tried accessing it, but I couldn't access the actual questionnaire. Yeah. Um, it's also interesting because done through the perception of owner, owner perception of the cat's personality, which Exactly. It's certainly a method trains the methodology a little bit. Yeah, because um, I think one of my main critiques of it was that what you really need is um, video evidence of the cat's behavior and seeing how it actually matches with uh, the human yeah. report and see how close it is. So I know that's what they do in a lot of um, uh, primate studies. Yeah. Okay. There we go. So they looked at this. So boldness, disinhibition, and pet unfriendliness. Um, mm. So that, that that's really interesting because like disinhibition um, and pet unfriendliness brings a higher quality cat owner relationship. Yeah. <laughs> and boldness, <laughs> which is which is really a, an interesting conclusion because mm. a a pet owner relationship involves a cat and the owner. Yeah. Um, but I would say like pet unfriendliness is actually uh, a territorial behavior. Um, mm. You know, cats do live in groups, but they, but they're exclusive groups, and it mm. takes them a, quite a while to warm up to to new animals in their environment. So, yeah. again, like to say that uh, pet, un so to, to to describe unfriendliness mm. um, to territorial guarding is again is, is like a huge projection of human values onto an animal, right? Because yeah. it's 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 not friendliness or unfriendliness. It's like imagine if some stranger walked into your house and started, yeah. you know, using your loo. I yeah. mean, it's not unfriendly to, to ask them what they're doing there. Yeah, so yeah. When you have a cat and you have another animal walk to their territory, and the cat hisses at them and maybe stares or <laughs> or gives them a squat. That's not unfriendliness. That's that's the equivalent of a human saying, "Excuse me, sir, um, is this yeah. your house?" Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't think maybe would label you a psychopath. Yeah, a <laughs> stranger is walking around your house, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. And and I think that, um, and I'm wondering if that actually the the way that we anthropomorphize cats in that particular area in terms of their so-called aggressive behaviors like that, uh, which aren't actually aggressive. Um, mm. I'm wondering if it's because um, cats always live in they in their minds are always in the wild. Um, it, is that how true would you say that is that I'd, I'd, 
I have a theory that cats and um, they've ne they've never been domesticated. Yeah. So, you know, so to them, they're always existing in the wild. And if they're in your house or they're out in the field, they're the same. Um, you know. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. Uh, I mean, you're, you're right that you know, I think the current, the current thought is that cats are not domesticated animals. They're mm. symbiotic animals to us. Yeah. And absolutely. They, they draw no distinction between being in the middle of a wild forest and being in the middle of mm. your living room. Yeah, uh, in the middle of a wild forest, they would also have a little <laughs> den or territory they mm. consider home. Um, mm. But that, at, at no point does that mean it's any safer than anywhere else in the forest, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think I think you're quite quite right there that there's no distinction there. They're they're always on. One of the things. Yeah, they're always on. Yeah, their ears are all like even if they're asleep or you think they're asleep, their ears start going like that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're always ready to react, and I mean, and that's just that's just a genetic predisposition, right? The, the cats who are a bit too slow to jump up and run were just never never made it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were the prey. <laughs> so what were the other? So we had boldness, yeah. um, which was just basically, uh, you know, they they looked at cats who were inter interacted a lot with with humans, and and it somehow discovered the boldness for it. In reality, that's probably yeah. just a question of how human centric these cats are. They yeah, have yeah. a very brave cat. Who would mm. stare down a wolf uh, who just mm. doesn't care much for humans and it may not want to interact with humans that much and yeah. um, you know saying that that cat isn't bold would be a very big stretch and mm. it might just not care for the way humans smell or move or something yeah. else right exactly uh, what was the other, what was the, other what was um, the second of the three traits there was a uh, meanness was one meanness. Other. yeah i think we've kind of covered that as well like yeah. in terms of just um if they hiss or swat or get the hackles up and you know, yeah, that's that, ascribing that again, saying that that's meanness is just such a yeah. odd interpretation of that. I mean, fearfulness, yeah. maybe, um, yeah, strong territorial instinct, maybe, mm. um, yeah. high emotional tone, yeah, perhaps. yeah, <laughs> just a bit stressed out, you know, <laughs> stressed, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Could could be, the boldness, those could be because I noticed yeah. that one phenomenon we see in the clinic is we see cats who are like super lovey dovey at home, they're just this sweetest cats who have like an amazing relationship with their owners but you bring them to the clinic and they're just they're monsters you know they're, they're dangerous <laughs> to work with you know we yeah. need three people in a towel to do anything wow with them. and that's just a stress response because these cats yeah. live a life that's just they live you often these are indoor cats who live in a small space so they just live oh, okay. in a perfectly secure stable environment where everybody loves them and then all of a sudden everything changes and cats are neophobic by nature right they don't mm. like change so yeah and these cats are very like like a lot of the cats that like get fired from vet clinics for being too aggressive are really sweet at home. And in fact, often I ask the owners, like I might have a cat that I can barely touch and I'm prescribing it, you know, okay, you gotta give it a pill twice a day. I often ask the owner, I'm like, how's the cat at home? Yeah. Um, because I don't want to tell them to give a cat a pill twice a day if the cat is a monster. Yeah. And most of the time I'm surprised to find out that the people are like, oh, of course I can give it a pill. It's, it's the best <laughs> cat in the world. What are you talking about? Yeah. And I'm really happy to hear that every time. Yeah. <laughs> It's actually it's quite funny hearing it that way around because um, um, one of my cats, Padme, she's um, she, she's very traumatized and feral when we got her, and um, I think it was one of the nurses at the clinic was the first person to ever stroke her because mm -hmm. we're like, oh, she's really feral, you know, you might have to hold it out or something, we don't know. And then uh, my partner took her uh, took her bay into the clinic, and then the nurse is just stroking her. Padme just cowers down and she just accepts everything being done to her. And you're like, yeah. you make us look like liars. <laughs> <laughs> well, funny, that's, that's a mirror image of that, is that mm. in cats who are quite stressy, sometimes, mm. like you said, they just hunker down and just freeze. And yeah. actually, they're actually quite, you know, you have to, these are the cats where you really, your cat handling skills will shine through. Because if, mm. if you, if you're, if you handle them, approach them the correct way, they'll just stay frozen. <laughs> you, can oh, okay. you, know, you can get blood samples from them and take yeah. x-rays and do catheters and they're okay. But yeah. there are definitely cats who, if you, if you push it, they're, they can be pushed over the line in an aggressive or defensive mm. response. So this yeah. is where you actually, you're, you know, clearly the, the nurse in your clinic knew what mm. she was doing. Yeah, yeah, she's really so good. They, yeah, they approach the cat. And if, if you, those cats, if you handle them right, they'll just stay frozen in fear. Yeah, yeah. Nice for the veterinary team. Uh, yeah. The veterinary team can't screw it up. Oh, okay. <laughs> it could go bad, could it? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, yeah we've been quite lucky. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and then the um, the last one actually was a disinhibition, um, and I think that's a little bit related to what we were just talking about um, in terms of like, the extroversion of the cats. And in the study, they tried to relate it to um, activity levels. Um, in study three, they checked cats' activity levels and their sleeping patterns, and it, it was quite a rudimentary technology they were using, but they were showing that um, that the cats who who reported higher or the owners reported them higher on disinhibition had more activity varying activity levels mm -hmm. um but i was thinking that disinhibition is probably quite a poor metric to use for cats because of their activity cycles the way mm -hmm. that they i guess a cat goes about their day is that it's varied they i mean no, they have set routines but they yeah. have you know spikes of energy throughout the day yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it just reminds me of a meme I saw yesterday, which is just a cat standing yeah. going, Good night, human. See you at 3 a.m. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I saw a funny video actually of um, a cat who'd uh, brought his food bowl into his owner's bedroom and was just patting it on the floor to get the human oh. to wake up. <laughs> it was okay. amazing. No, no, tell me, is that cat a psychopath or just the smartest cat? Yeah. Like out of a, <laughs> smartest out of a million cats in the world. Well, according to the study, they're probably showing traits of psychopathy, but to us, I think it's a smart cat. <laughs> smart cat? Yeah, identified all the links. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, the cat deserves extra food for that, I think. <laughs> uh -huh. I think there'll be a grievous mistake on the owner's part unless they really want to be woken up at 3 a.m. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't reward the behavior. <laughs> yeah. No. Not to be reinforced, <laughs> which is not to say the cat doesn't deserve a, a treat. I mean, that is one impressive cat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But maybe give him a treat in a different context. <laughs> yeah. yeah, teach him to bring that bowl to you at uh, 10 a.m. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so talking about uh, cat behaviors, actually, th there was quite a few um, misunderstandings, I thought, in the article. Um, but since I'm a psychologist of the human variety, you know, I mainly work in mental health. Um, so I thought I'd get your opinion on some of the behaviours of of what they've talked about in this in the paper and what they're claiming it's about, and then what your perception of it actually is. Um, sure. Yeah. So one of the ones is about what cats do when they're fearful. So they're mm -hmm. saying that there's blinking and nose licking. Yeah, and they're, they're saying that their expressions of fear if they blink and lick the nose. So that's an interesting one because there's definitely there's been a lot of, I guess, behavioural work done mm. on what that means okay. um i i don't i i would so first of all uh slow blinking in cats is 100 percent not fear mm. uh a cat who slow blinks at you is basically smiling like cats mm. smile by slowly blinking um, yeah it has a lot to do with the fact that a cat's social interactions have a lot to do with how open their eyes are that if they their eyes are wide open or staring at you, but they don't trust you. If their eyes are half closed, it's an expression of trust. So cat blinks are smiles, so mm. definitely not fearful. Um, <laughs> and occasionally, and Mr. Pirate does this, and this really slow, like one eye blink, like very suggestive. And that's <laughs> the biggest thing ever. But it's also it was like the biggest expression of love that a cat can telegraph to you. Yeah, yeah. So that's now rapid blinking. Um, I've never, I've never read anything, and I'm not an animal behavioralist. So there's definitely could be something out there I'm not aware of, but I've never heard rapid blinking mentioned as uh, fearful trading cats. And, and also doesn't make a lot of sense because the only thing I know about cats is when the cats are scared, their mm. eyes are like this. Yes. And they're, open, and they're staring at you and they don't mm. blink for a freaking minute or two and it's creepy ass. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I see a lot of stressed out cats. I don't perceive them blinking a lot. Mostly they're just like two saucers staring at me and their pupils are dilated. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see, you can actually, you can measure the adrenaline pumping through a system by like how dilated your pupils are. Yeah, so yeah. I'm a little surprised to hear that interpretation. Now, nose licks, um, they can be a sign of uncertainty in the cat. The cat's not okay. quite sure what's going on. They'll send them mm -hmm. lick and chop their lips, and they don't like it much. Uh, mm -hmm. I know I, I read one study, which I've tried to replicate and failed at home, to mm -hmm. say that if you lick your lips while looking at your cat, your cat will lick their lips back at you. Oh, and interesting. 
I, I have a hard time getting my cast to do that, but yeah. uh, I encourage everybody to try and see what happens. I'm gonna have to try it now. Actually, in the, in the comments below, tell us if you could make your cat lick their nose. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, it can be like a, a nervous or, um, or again, or like an uncertainty behavior. We know that dogs yawn when they're not sure what's going on. And dogs, it's very well described. The dogs yawn when they're confused, which okay. they are a lot of the time. Also, occasionally when they're sleeping. Cats will also yell when they're sleepy, but I think they'll do it when they're uncertain about things. I don't think that's a fear behavior. I, I've never heard of it described as a fear behavior. Like, like to me, cats who are afraid, they either go completely still. Mm -hmm. So I think there's two, in my experience, there's two flavors of cat fear. One is when they just freeze up, like we just talked about a minute ago in the clinic, mm -hmm. when they're basically go completely still, they stare in the direction of the threat. Their eyes are like giant saucers. Um, and then maybe they try to make a silent exit and sneak, slink away yeah. if, if, or they just freeze there. Yeah. The other, I think, fear response, of course, is more of an aggressive, is, you know, ears peeled back, kissing. Uh, they may even, you know, lash out if, if something comes near them, uh, but then draw back. Um, okay. That would be, again, or, or just, or again, the other thing is they puff up, themselves and this and like fly off in an opposite direction it's yeah. that's an acute fear response yeah um, i don't think that's i don't think any of those were described in this behavior. no no they weren't no no I, I, the it's whole tail, maybe yeah <laughs> it's the one where cats just kind of go nope and just leave that's one of my favorite ones if they're like they're not sure about a situation yeah. i just love the way they just go i mean that's what yeah. mine do anyway they're like, oh, I'm not this. Run to do it, right? And then little yeah. slinky kind of. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like pitter patter. Yeah. Hard no. Out of here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is actually something that I've noticed a lot um, in the sort of the cat adopters group I'm part of. Um, like if they get a new adopter, they often talk about the biting or scratching when they're playing, and mm -hmm. when the cat shows their belly, because obviously every every first time cat owner thinks tickle the belly if I see it. And then they regret it afterwards. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I just wondering what are the different expressions of biting or scratching if you're playing with the cat? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a that could be a whole video topic to itself. Right. Um, but <laughs> what I do say is that when cats fight, they mm. bite. Mm. And when they and they bite, you know, the cat teeth are really sharp. So they bite deep and it hurt and they draw blood. Mm. Uh, so if your cat bites you, but your skin isn't broken, your cat didn't bite you. Your okay. cat play bit you, it might have been, sometimes doing a grooming, like sometimes if I'm petting a cat, sometimes they'll give you a little, little kind of nibble on your, on your skin, which might be quite unpleasant for a human, probably feels awesome if you're a cat. And that's <laughs> the grooming behavior. And during a play session, it may bite you just because they're play biting others. You know, they're, you know, play behavior in animals is training. Yeah. Uh, and they're training for hunting, they're training for you know, uh, fighting for mates or fighting for territorial defense. It's, it, you know, play behavior in a cat. It's basically like a Rocky Montage, right? There's <laughs> yeah. one thing cats need to do, and that's kill, kill, kill. There's three, there's three things cats need to do, and they're all kill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, a cat playing is just a Rocky training montage, and of course they're going to nibble mm. on you. Um, but again, if your skin's not broken, your cat isn't going to bite you. Mm. It might not be pleasant. You might not want them to do it again, but it's mm. for your peace of mind they didn't bite you. Because if they bit you, you'd be bleeding. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, of course, accidents happen. They might bite you and make you bleed without meaning to, but 99% of the time, right? Yeah. Like everything in science. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Scratching even more so. Like when cats play, they scratch. So most human cat scratches occur when people actually don't react inappropriately to the cat, not when the cat reacts inappropriately to people. Mm. So, I mean, cat claws can be quite sharp. The cat latches onto you. The instinct for us is to drop back. But mm. cat claws are hooks. They're mm. designed to keep things close to the cat. So if a cat has their claws on you and you drop back, mm. you're going to get blood and you scratch yourself. The cat's innocent. Yeah. yeah. If you leave your hand in place, which is hard, the chances of it breaking skin are very low. Yeah. And in fact, I've been in many situations where, where I have a cat lashed around my hand, mm. four paws in, and they're gnawing on me. And it kind of hurts. unpleasant. <laughs> and the way out of that situation is to actually. I, I, I wish I could come up with a movie reference because I know this happens in movies a lot, but it's to yeah. sit there and not move. Yeah. And chances are you're going to get out of that encounter without a single break in your skin. Mm. Uh, often what I do is I reach out the other hand and just 
I soothe the cat. I'll gently stroke him on the back of the head or the back of the neck, okay. and then wait for him to release, and then I get my hands out of dodge. Yeah. Not fast, because I want to trigger a strike, but I just mm. threw my hand. But if you draw back, I mean, I've been scratched, especially as a kid. Everyone's been scratched by a cat, right? Yeah, yeah. It happens when you pull back. You just leave your hand in place. Mm. Even if they're striking at you, and the cat does, does this to you, mm. you actually, you know, I'm not saying leave your hand in front of an aggressive cat, but you got to use your judgment. Oftentimes, they strike at you. If you, if you it won't hurt. It won't break your skin. Yeah, yeah. As long as you don't pull back. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, interesting. So, and and then, and of course, when cats play together, like I often have people concerned about cats being violent to each other. And again, mm. if two cats rolling around, there's fur flying, they're hissing, mm. but you're not taking them to the vet to get a cat bite abscess treated the next day. Mm. They weren't fighting; they were just playing. Well, okay. Training. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so uh, I think, yeah, I, think, I forgot what the question was, but that's my answer. <laughs> yeah, no, it was just about, um, yeah, uh, scratching and biting um, in play behavior. But um, yeah, that was actually really helpful. One of the things I've noticed, because I have a question about um, how solitary cats are, and I've noticed everything we've been talking about is about cats being sociable. So mm -hmm. that, I think that's kind of, we've answered the question really throughout the whole interview is, are cats solitary animals? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's... I think that's a really uh, common misconception. The fact mm. that cats are actually very social animals, but mm. they're solitary hunters. I think that's where people get confused. Mm. Cats yeah. hunt on their own, but in, in the wild, they actually live in colonies. They're a social mm. animal. Yeah, yeah. They're very, they have a very interesting colony structure, but yeah, no, they're totally social animals. And, and they live socially with humans. Like they have a, mm. a, hum, a cat social mm. skill set, and they have a human social skill set. Certain social skills that cats have are specifically directed only at you. Yeah. And not all cats have those in, in equal amounts. But yeah, they're yeah. totally social. And one of the most interesting things about them is that they can take in um, babies of other species and look after them. Like I saw one the other day where a, a cat's taken in like eight hedgehogs that, <laughs> that were orphaned. And, yeah. then, and then she's just lying there with all these hedgehogs on her. Just, yeah. <laughs> That's adorable. Yeah, I, I think it's a, it must be something to do with if if um, the the female cat finds the young at a certain point in her biology, uh, maybe she's just given up a litter or something, so she's still got the instincts or something. Yeah, I mean that's certainly more like I know. I mean, fostering it hasn't been described in the animal kingdom in many scenarios. I think there's mm. a famous story going around a couple of years ago, but I think it was a jaguar or a lion who fostered like a gazelle, like a prey animal, like. Yeah. It happens. It's rare, and absolutely, it, it, it's more likely to happen if, uh, you know, like if it's a nursing queen or in the right cycle. Mm -hmm. But it, yeah, it's an interesting phenomenon. It certainly happens, and yeah. I think maybe it's maybe more likely to be observed in house cats because house cats are well fed. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, and there's it, no it's competition. Yeah, it's all about context, <laughs> too. They, you know, if yeah. you introduce um, a little fluffy thing that could be a prey item, but it's not treated like a prey item, maybe doesn't behave like a prey item because it's too young to really know better. Um, mm. And a cat's brain, which is fairly algorithmic, you know, they're not yeah. complicated, uh, you know, as far as cognitive <laughs> capacity goes. They yeah. just, you know, they, they're trying, they're like, which bin do we put this in? Ah, we yeah. put this in a baby bin. Must be a cat baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> a good way of looking at it, actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Even with all the criticisms that, that obviously we've covered about the study, um, I think they had quite noble reasons for doing it, that they wanted to kind of address something in the, it, I guess, in the cat community where people don't understand their cats properly. And, you know, they wanted to develop a questionnaire to help people understand yeah. cats better. And I think there's actually a need for that kind of measure in um, for new adopters or not. A hundred percent. Uh, absolutely. I think, I mean, honestly, uh, uh, my life's work is to help people understand their cats better. Um, mm. That's my YouTube channel is a largely part about that. And uh, mm. it's something I'm very passionate about. I think helping people understand the animals that share their life is, is hugely enriching to both the humans and the animals. Mm. It really helps build that animal-human bond. Um, but I, I think that it has to be done, the, if it's, it has to be done through an evidence-based lens that mm. understands the nuances of animal behavior and i think that this yeah. was definitely a a bit of a misguided effort i mean they mm. i think their motivations might be noble but the tool yeah. set that they use is not right for the job totally i think using like using human uh, 
human sent developed questionnaires and assessments is just the wrong tool to do this. And mm. I, I think it's as likely or more likely to do harm than good, to be quite honest. Mm. Uh, like I said, it, it, well, I think most, it could potentially discourage people from interacting with cancer or brain cancer or life. So, and it's definitely, I don't think it really adds much value to people's understanding of, of, a, of yeah. the way cats experience the world around them. And to mm. me, um, one of the best parts of having a pet, of sharing your life with an animal, is mm. to see something that's completely alien to you yeah. experience your world with you and see the way they react to it. Yeah, and I think yeah. the alienness part that's missing from this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I, I think when we think about how the personality model for humans started, um, you know, it, it's decades of research and lots of um, theories floating around and until we got to the five factor model of personality, that took a lot of work. And I think that to do that for cats, we can't just transpose that over to the animal kingdom. I think we have to treat the species as like you say, as alien as new and build the personality models from the ground up because mm. I think cats in particular, um maybe more so than other animals i think um they're going to need their own approach and their own models to to sort of map out their psychology i think um yeah. and yeah it's just yeah because i think more than any other mammals in the mammal kingdom um i kind of feel that like cats are more different than us uh, they're more different to us than any other uh, than any of the other mammals um <laughs> i mean that's a uh, uh... I think that's a maybe matter of perspective. Yeah. Uh, I certainly, I, I think there's a lot of people who feel like they relate to different animals or different aspects of animals, uh, stronger or weaker. But I absolutely agree that uh, if you're going to study, like, that the, the, there has been work done, obviously, in the field of animal behavior, trying to develop models for assessing behavior of different species, but it has to be a species specific model, 100%. Yeah. And there's definitely still tons of work that could be done in any of the common species. You know, it gets done a lot on, on the farm animal side of things, right? Like mm. Temple Grandin is a great example. It's yeah. She really led um, the, the, the re a revolution in behavioral science mm. um, focused around farm animal welfare. Yeah. And I think that there's all work is done around that because obviously welfare is a big part of, of food production. You know, a lot mm. of people don't. Might not think so, but it's actually a large part of animal food product or food production is, is focusing on the welfare of the animals and natural behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, but it has to be very species specific. And you yeah. know, as in, I know in vet school, you know, I work with cattle and horses as well as cats and dogs and pigs, and they're all so different. Yeah, they're all so different, <laughs> and it's, working with them is very different, and it requires uh, really understanding the differences in their in their behavior. And the psychology mm -hmm. might not be. I'm I'm not sure that the I mean, the term psychology can be applied to them because okay. I mean, their brains are so different from ours, right? Their cognitive mm. landscape is so different from a human, but they're yeah. all very very different from each other as well. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point actually. Because I guess that when we think about psychology, we tend to think in terms of um, of just that human element and how that's and then we we take that those assumptions. And then we start applying them in the animal kingdom. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I think I'd have to think about that a bit more, actually. That's a really good point. Um, so we yeah. end up having a bad experience on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, yeah. This is why I don't have a Twitter account. <laughs> I, can't yeah. handle, I couldn't handle the stress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so th they bring up about euthanasia as the biggest cause of death for domestic cats. Mm -hmm. um and how much of that do you see from euthanasia from illness or euthanasia from kill shelters or just from yeah, cats so are unwanted uh, this is another yeah so they're not wrong mm. um so we know that behavioral problems are the number one reason for surrender of pets to shelters okay and certainly euthanasia is a possible outcome of a pet being surrounded to, shel to a shelter, in fact, quite a high likelihood outcome, right? Mm. Uh, I, I have, as a veterinarian, I have very strong feelings about people who surrender their pets to shelters rather than take personal responsibility for the pet. Yeah. Um, they're not good feelings, they're very negative feelings. 
Mm. Um, but yeah, I think behavioral issues, but that's is and also behavioral issues is an incredible catch all term. Mm. Uh, it's a massive kitchen sink term that uh, could really be broken down. Um, the other side of it is that certainly in areas where there is a, uh, particularly in urbanized areas where there is a large feral cat population, there's typically programs, animal control programs where these animals are caught and you know put in a shelter. And if, if somebody doesn't want to take them home, they're euthanized. So they're um, in that regard um, certainly can add a lot to the feline mortality, right? Because mm -hmm. the goal of the program is to reduce feline, feral feline population, and the city doesn't care how they do it. They're just mm. as happy to kill the cats as, as to have them find a new home, right? And yeah. It's certainly not all feral cats necessarily make good pets, because as we mentioned mm. earlier, cats co-evolve with humans. They're not domesticated. Mm. Uh, I went to a behavioral conference with a student where they, they brought up a really interesting point that a certain percentage of kittens, maybe 10, 20 percent of kittens, mm. um, I, I don't know, maybe I'm not remembering that number wrong, but a significant percentage of kittens will just never make a good pet. They're cats mm. who are not interested in sharing life with humans. They yeah. want to be out in the woods, killing things, yeah. hiding from coyotes. Mm. Like they just have no interest in living in a house. And you know, those you can't force one of those cats to be a good pet any more than you can force a yeah. badger to be a good pet. They're just wild animals, right? Mm. So I mean, I, I do think that helping people relate to cats and understand cats will definitely reduce the amount of behaviorally triggered um, shelter surrenders. Mm. Uh, and, and it might even increase the rate of adoption. Certainly a lot of animal welfare and behavioralist work is aimed at work in shelters. There's a lot of behavioralists who work in like SPCA or animal humane society contexts mm -hmm. and try, and in fact, they've this, let the, this work has led to changes in the way these animals are processed, housed and treated, which increase adoption rates. We know that we do certain mm -hmm. things, we increase adoption rates. Some of the work was actually done uh, by students from the Animal Welfare Department at UBC here in Vancouver and in the Vancouver SPCA. It's really a lot of the seminal work on cat housing was done here. So, we you know, we make big differences to adoption rates. And in that yeah. regard, uh, I think animal behavior definitely is crosses over into animal welfare. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but at the same time, uh, there will always be a percentage of animals who simply will never make it pets. In the case yeah. of cats, that's often just feral cats who just have no interest in being with humans. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, they either get, end up getting euthanized or in some cases, you know, sent out to a farm somewhere where they can kill rats and, and help us, yeah. with which is a fantastic place for them. Again, yeah, yeah. In Vancouver, there's a number of um, farms that are kind of make it known that they'll accept drop off cats and drop cats, people drop cats. And not that, it, not that you should do this. A lot of farmers <laughs> are like, but uh, yeah. some farms will actually accept cats and the cat colonies live on our farm, keep the rodents down. You know, yeah. it's a thing. Do the cat um, job. <laughs> yeah, I mean, with dogs, it's a little bit more complicated because mm. a lot of the dog and behavioral issues are often caused by poor socialization and mm. they're caused by the humans or the breeders or it, sometimes it's what happens to the dog before it gets to their family. Sometimes it's what's done by the family. Mm. And that is a really thorny issue because a lot of these dogs are basically, they cool, like cool and traumatized children. It takes a tremendous amount of work to make, turn them into something that looks like a good pet and sometimes yeah. it's impossible. And mm. and so some a lot of these dogs, euthanasia is really the only option for them because they'll just mm. never be a good pet. They'll never be okay, and mm. they can't just live in a shelter their whole life. So, um, you know, certainly I think a, a certain proportion of behavioral euthanasia is unavoidable. And mm. uh, just a quick plug here: you know, no kill shelters or animal rescues that refuse to euthanasia are deeply problematic in this regard because often okay. end up with animals that have mm. absolutely no future as a pet. Yeah. And often this leads to actually serious animal welfare concerns, like real decrease in animal's quality of life, where these animals, you know, euthanasia would actually make their life better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I have a lot of people really like this idea of no-kill shelters or mm. no-kill rescues, but I personally do not support them, and I think that they're mm. deeply problematic because they ignore certain facts. Again, mm. this is maybe a bit of anthropomorphization, but they <laughs> ignore certain facts about not all animals will ever make good pets, right? Yeah. And they have limited room for it, limited places in society. Right? Yeah, I think um, that's when, like, sort of like the ideology of of an idea kind of takes hold, isn't it? And because mm -hmm. um, I, I imagine that having a total no kill shelter, like you say, is a bit unsustainable. It's problematic for the welfare of some of these cats, and maybe there's a bit more of a compromise that, that could be had with them 
where they could i don't know there's got to be a i don't know what kind of what would be a workable solution for, for yeah. a service like that but yeah yeah well i mean just i mean you're right it's a it's a problem without any simple solution yeah um, but it's definitely um how you say yeah it's definitely a lot of work has been done in this area and there's certainly a lot of progress has been made in helping adoption rates and a very measurable outcome so this is a great yeah. thing to study because you can really measure outcomes very well and um yeah. certainly uh you know on a local level people can encourage their local municipal shelters or local societies to engage with this kind of work um, but i think uh, yeah it, it, it's definitely a complicated question it's one without a simple answer and i think that um if there was somebody who's going to develop a, a measure like this or something about personality types in cats um for actually for it to be useful i think it should probably account for sort of feral and ex-feral cats and non-feral cats you know because i don't know from my experience it's quite limited but i feel like these are just completely different types of cats with different issues and different personalities oh completely yeah we know that kittens of feral uh feral queens so mm. the feral cats are much more likely to be feral or much less likely to be human-centric okay. um Whereas on the other extreme, you, know, you look at Mr. Pirate, yeah. uh, who I raised when he was a week old. I'm basically his mother, as I always <laughs> often like to mention. He's a very human centric cat. Yeah, yeah. He's he lovely. Know what that is, actually. Yeah. <laughs> One of those three old humans walking around and yeah. helping him. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, it, definitely, it definitely needs to account for uh, where they come from. Yeah, yeah. Because it, with, with Hermione and Padme, like I was saying earlier, like they were both quite heavily traumatized. Um, like it's one of those times where their first home when they were kittens said that they were very violent and aggressive but then you see the cat and you're like what it's a tiny little ball of fluff how is that yeah. violent and aggressive um I mean, yeah yeah i mean if, if a kitten isn't violent and aggressive you should take them to the vet right away they probably have something seriously wrong with them <laughs> yeah 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 and uh, and then because of the reaction of the family the way they treated them it completely traumatized them and now they basically they hate all humans except for me and my partner and then that that's all they, they they've bonded with us and that's it for them <laughs> you know that works yeah 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 they're quite happy now um <laughs> yeah <laughs> from a cat's perspective that sounds great sorry from the cat's perspective that sounds great yeah yeah they've got two servants you know they get um, hot and roll, hot and cold dinners you know <laughs> <laughs> i have a yeah. question for you yeah um as somebody who works in in, in human psychology, um, what do you think is the motivation for uh, psychologists to human psycholo trains like human psychologists to venture into the animal behavior field? Mm. That's a really good question. Mm. I'll think about that a sec. Because I think there are quite a few different reasons. Um, certainly, when I I, um, I co-authored a paper a few years ago. And that was on chimpanzees and i kind of fell into that by accident because i was a student and it was interesting and i was able to do some research while i was a student so i was one of those people that kind of fell into that in terms of the people that did this particular paper i think it was more of like i have a cat and i like my cat i love psychology and i do personality research so i want to research it so I'll right. combine the two and I'll have a bit of fun while I do the research without really thinking of the consequences. Um, um, but there are others, I think, that if they're more evolutionary psychologists, I think it's because they want to find out the answers of why we're the way we are. Mm. And so by unlocking um, some of the mysteries of um, other species, um, particularly our closest, ancestors, our closest cousins, uh, we might find out how and where certain things evolved over time so um just for example like our brain structure is pretty much the like the physiological aspect of the brain is i mean please correct me if i'm wrong um is the same in all mammalian species um mm -hmm. to a certain extent i mean the size changes but um particularly in the deep brain it's all the same and so that tells us something about how we evolved so i think that's another reason why a lot of them That'd be the less superficial reasons why. 
you know, other than falling into it or because we've got a pet. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, that's super interesting. Is that you're right? I mean, as much as we talk today about differences between species, there's definitely commonalities, both anatomically, as you mentioned, and um, yeah. definitely. I mean, there's definitely a lot we can relate to, in the cat or or a horse or a hedgehog. Yeah. Um, that's, I think it's also really important to remember is that there's we have we share so much with the other animals that surround us. You know, everybody's yeah. different, but we share so so much. Yeah, we um yeah even within humans we are more alike than we are different. Like you go to anybody around the world, we all have the same concerns, the same worries. We all have the same biology. You know, and it, it, yeah, and particularly at the moment where things are so crazy politically in the world, and you know, with the with the the thing that shall not be named. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you just kind of think that, you know, we, a lot of us have forgotten all the similarities of what makes us human and how all, you know, we've formed all these communities all over the world and we've made them work. Like, that's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, and, you know, the, the fact that cats can do similar things, they can form little societies, they have entire hierarchies and... They have friends and they have enemies and mm-hmm. you know the, the people they they've got other cats they just don't like the face of you know <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I just find it so interesting um I mean, that's one of the reasons why i personally am interested in cats um because it, it i find it's an animal that i can kind of relate to in a way and i find them hugely rewarding particularly feral cats that if you put the effort in you get out what you put in and if you mm-hmm. take that time with them uh, more often than not, unless it's like you say, when there's ten or twenty percent of the cats that are just feral, and you, you're never going to be able to win them over. But um, but most feral cats, yeah, that yeah, get what you get out what you put in. Yeah, so. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I, I I say that I think that's true of any any relationship, and specifically human animal relationship is. <laughs> yeah, the more you put into it, the more you get back. Even, yeah. even if it's a cat who doesn't care much for you. You know, to give you that one headbutt every month is yeah. like really the most precious thing. Yeah, <laughs> it really is. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people that can relate to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I remember that, that one little sliver of attention from your cat. It's almost like yeah. a abusive relationship. You're like, yes, you noticed me. Yeah. <laughs> you some more food. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the cat's like, oh, I can manipulate this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I think with Padme, um, the first time I was able to stroke her, it, it was just so funny how it happened because um, Hermione and Padme were lying next to each other on a blanket and I was um, stroking Hermione and then I noticed Padme wasn't freaked out and we'd had her about three years by this point. So I just kept stroking Hermione closer and closer to Padme and then, and then eventually I just slowly started stroking Padme and then she just accepted it and just oh, didn't freak out and it took three years to get that <laughs> and then it was just like you say it's like oh my god <laughs> this is the best thing ever <laughs> oh, that's fantastic yeah yeah we we did um we did try your, you know one of your videos about the football catch like trying to pick up a cat like that yeah, uh, yeah hermione didn't take to that at all we tried it and then yeah. she like rabbit kicked me and ran away <laughs> yeah yeah that's a you want to be wearing if you're doing that on a feral cat you want to be wearing thick sleeves <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> well um, she was all right with being picked up at that point um but we just we were just trying to find different ways to get them in the box and all that stuff oh yeah um they just do it voluntarily now so yeah it's just not a That's problem anyway. way. <laughs> yeah yeah like yeah. especially with padme she because she knows the routine and i just mm-hmm. put the box in front of her now and she just kind of just looks really resigned and she's like Okay, fine. <laughs> Off to the vet. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, she always comes back happy and healthy. So you know, I think she's linked that in her mind. I, uh, yeah. then, I think there's something at play where she realizes that she goes away, and then she goes to see the nice nurse or the nice vet, and then they they they, they stroke her and they talk to her, and then she comes back and she feels better. Yeah. So I think you know, I think she's kind of linked that somehow. But yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, the veterinary team can make a huge difference. Like, mm. not, not, there are definitely some cats and dogs who will never like going to the vet, mm. but it is tremendous what a difference 
uh, a skill vendor team can make. Like, like I, I've worked in many hospitals. I've seen places where every cat is just a ball of teeth and claws. Yeah. Um, I've seen hospitals where every dog is just a nervous wreck. And I've seen mm. hospitals where, you know, cats just chill in the console room and let you look in their mouth and oh. where dogs wag their tail. And it's a and having worked in the back of all of these, I guarantee yeah. you, it's a veterinary team skill in handling animals that the term is ninety percent of that. Yeah, except for that one cat who just will hate you no matter what. No matter <laughs> what. But, eh, that's life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so actually, um, just while we're on the topic of clinics and stuff, sometimes you'll see, say, like a big brand like Pets at Home, and they sometimes have a clinic out back that people could take their pet to. Yeah. Um, I'm just like I, I'm always naturally suspicious of everything. I've always preferred like no, I'll take them to a vet that's not attached to a brand, you know that kind of thing. Yeah. It, I mean, is, are these vets kind of reliable, or is it something you you can't even comment on? Or I mean, that's a really complicated question. Okay, um, I, I would say that in general terms, you know, it's a, it's a valid question, uh, especially with the you know. Uh, with the advent of corporate veterinary medicine, like fifty percent of clinics in North America are owned by corporate entities by now, okay. um, and it's only set to grow. And I think UK might even be higher than that. Mm. Um, I would say that o overall, uh, they're all. I would say that you can't judge a clinic by whether it's part of a corporate entity or not. There's many other okay. things in play that determine whether they're competent, and mm. honest, and. Um, as as an owner, pretty much you have no idea what's going on. For the clinic, yeah. it's really hard to judge. Um, yeah. Maybe the topic of future videos of mine uh, yeah. that I might make uh, when I'm ready to retire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, pissing off half my profession or three quarters <laughs> of my profession. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I would say that <laughs> corporate ownership is not is not a guarantee. It's neither a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a thing. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah. There's certainly in some contexts. Some of the things about corporate practice is actually much better than small mm. general independent practice. Some things might be worse. Mm. Also, every corporation is also different. There's definitely some areas there. So yeah, uh, you can't totally. make a blanket statement, but um, uh, I definitely wouldn't use that one criteria to decide where I take my pet. There's many other yeah. criteria to use. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it, for other people who, I guess, aren't animal behaviorists or we're not, we don't work with animals on a daily basis or anything. Mm -hmm. For anybody else that's going to be doing studies like this in the future, what kind of things should they keep in mind before they do the study while they're in their implementation phase? Well, that's a great question. Um, yeah. My advice would be to just to be aware of, know what your field is and know when you're stepping outside of it hmm. and reach out to somebody who to collaborate with. It, um, you know, there are definitely there's animal behavioralists, there are animal welfare departments and animal behavior departments in most universities. Uh, and also there are vet schools with um, veterinary behavior specialists. So just, I think it's just important to know, know what your field is and know when you're working outside of it and, and, and find experts to work with. Yeah. Um, you know, there's the, uh, there's definitely um, specifically from veterinary side, you know, there's in North America, there's the college of veterinary, um, the American College of Veterinary Animal Behavioralists, which is, uh, you know, uh, a college that oversees a four-year residency in animal behavior, and they qualify veterinarians who are specifically behavior specialists. I think in UK, the Royal College also has a veterinary behavioralist designation. So you can seek experts, clinical experts in animal behavior. You can also definitely find academics who study animal behavior. There's mm. lots of them, and yeah. uh, they really all need to publish papers. So yeah, yeah. To collaborate with <laughs> if that is a field of interest. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, we're, now that we're in a publish or perish um, era in universities, so yeah, I think people will only be too happy to collaborate. Really, yeah, and it's it's definitely yeah, it's particularly in, in medical research, but I think probably in other areas of research as well. Uh, mm. I think uh, the fields that are focused a lot of animal on human health or mm. human psychology, it's important to remember that humans are not necessarily unique. They're just one yeah. of many species on Earth. Um, mm. Certainly, I've been involved in medical research for my life. And again, just remembering that there are experts out there on animal health uh, would, 
would probably save billions of dollars in medical research and yeah. many years of waste of time. Let me yeah. say that. That's, that's all I'm going to say about that. But, <laughs> but yeah, a bit, a bit of arrogance in the human medical field has probably cost us decades of progress and billions of dollars. Yeah, I agree with that, I think. <laughs> From my limited experience and stuff, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, but yeah, um, that's everything I've got, actually, for today. Uh, awesome. I never know how to end these things. All my videos just end. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I would say a great weekend is it has been a pleasure chatting with you. It's been a really yeah. fun conversation. Yeah. And uh, you know, if we find another topic where where areas of expertise overlap, I'd be happy to do another one of these with you. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I've I've had a really good time. And uh, thanks for giving me over an hour of your time today. Um oh, I really, really, really appreciate it. Yeah, and I can thank our viewers for watching this. And stick, you know, yeah, everybody's still watching this. Thanks for sticking with us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like a fireside chat, isn't it? You know, right. <laughs> Have a cup of coffee and chill while you listen to it. <laughs> hey, I mean, you know, uh, it, I think this is a great way to really chew over a topic and have a good time doing it.